My name is Victor Valdez, and uh, I've been attending Sulon Hollow for almost three years already. I'm original from uh, Guatemala. Hi, uh, my name is Evelyn Valdez. I've been here for three years at Long Hollow, and I'm also from Guatemala. Yeah, right now we're we're working, you know, with um, a different groups around the city. Uh, we have a few families now living in this area, so ha that's how we try to stay connected with, that, with those families. Especially, we have a few families in the other side of town. Um, and uh, we go over there weekly or bi-weekly um, with the live groups. Um, and that's how we, we started with that family. Yes. Uh, there are maybe uh, six live groups. There are Spanish-speaking families that gather together weekly. And uh, every week, more, more families are coming to Long Hollow. And what I love about uh, teaching the Word of God to people from other nations is that um, many of these people will go back to their countries or they go visit their countries, their families, or they, they keep in touch with their families. So when they get to know the Word, they will keep spreading the Word of God. Everything begins with um the kindness of the small kindness thing that you do in a person. And like I said, again, it's a lifestyle. Wherever you go, there's people in need. Um, what we usually do, you know, during the during the week, we always, for some reason, people reach, reach to us. Um, and the way we work is, you know, they're always people in need of praying, people in the hospital people going through hard times in their lives. And that's how the connection starts. Um, after that, there's already something there to work with, you know, and just invite them to church. It's not gonna happen maybe the first time, not even the second time, but if you keep working through that family, that's how uh, God can use the single kindness to that person to uh, work in their, their hearts. We've been doing a lot of activities here at church. Uh, we're so glad that there is a, a translation system where people from other nations that come here to Long Hollow and they don't speak English yet, they're still learning, and they're able to listen to the message in their own language. But also through the missions ministry here along Hollow, uh, sometimes we do block parties and we go to the Hispanic communities. And we also have other uh, groups that meet weekly on their homes, Spanish-speaking people. And they are learning the word and not only learning, but also uh, we wish that they could have this passion to go and keep sharing the gospel everywhere we go. And that's how uh, more people is coming to know Christ. During that process, um, sometimes it's not something that is natural you know, in us. Um, and there's something that we can ask Jesus to put in our heart, that desire. You know, we can say, I'm not good at this, I'm not good at that. But if we can pray to Him, He can put that desire in us to help and, 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 and share the good news of God. It's not easy at the beginning. It's all, I mean, it's going to be uh, hard times. Yes. Sometimes that you don't want to do it. You want to stay at home and relax. <laughs> but when you have that inside in your heart, I think uh, even if you're, if you're tired, when you got a fire on you or what God has put in you, that's going to allow you to do what we do. As Paul said that he felt compelled to share the good news, I think it's not because of our perfect life, because we don't have a perfect life. It's by God's grace that he allows us to, to share with others how good he is, how amazing he is. And um, we hope that 
uh, everyone who's listening to this story um, could open their hearts to the calling that God has for you because I think this is the best time to share how good our God is. Good morning. Welcome to Mission Sunday. Uh, incredible. Thank you, Victor and Evelyn. What a powerful. Uh, man, I'm excited to be able to share with you today, and I mean that. I'm honored to be able to share. Um, I love you. I love our, our church people. I love this church. Um, it is um, incredible to be part of and to see what God is building here, what God is building here. And so it's, this is great, and I'm excited that you're here for Mission Sunday. A very special thank you to Pastor Robbie for the opportunity to speak. Um, it's a big deal to be able to do this. And listen, um, I, I need to say this about Pastor Robbie. He's, he's the real deal. It's easy to follow a man who is listening for God and following after God. And so uh, very grateful for the opportunity. Today, uh, if we were to title this sermon, it would be called this, We're Here to Get Involved. So if you take notes and all those things, I'll say some different things about underlining and circling and all that. But the title of today is We Are Here to Get Involved, and we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll start there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are here to get involved. Have you ever been given uh, an assignment or asked to do something that was pretty serious, but you didn't take it seriously? I'm sure we all have. I have. I probably have more than I care to list. But one comes to mind that's uh, it's entertaining is in college, right? In college, uh, I worked a job uh, with my friend Jeff. We uh, were putting ourselves through college, so we worked different jobs. And this one particular job was at a restaurant. And one day, we'd work most of the day, and it was getting close to 9 o'clock when the restaurant would close. And our manager came up to us and said, uh, Jeff's, the two Jeff's, I need you guys to do something for me. I was in the men's room, and I saw a footprint on the back of the toilet, like the top part. And he said, I need you guys to go open the drop ceiling and see if anybody's hiding up there. And so Jeff and I were like, of course. We've never been on a manhunt before. Why not start today, right? So we started walking that way. We grabbed, um, grabbed a ladder and uh, made our way to the bathroom, and we climbed up there. And, you know, to the best of my recu uh, recollection, I'm fairly certain I was wearing an apron. So I, I was fully prepared for whatever was going to happen, right? Uh, we pull back the thing, and we, the, the drop ceiling, and we start looking around. And there's light coming from the bottom. There's no light up there. There's a lot of shadows. And Jeff and I are just like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. There's nobody hiding up here. How's this even possible? So we just start mocking a would-be hiding out guy, you know, like, hey, bad guy, and just having fun. And we're looking at each other like, man, let's go. So after a minute or so, we close the lid, and we take the ladder back, and we go back and report to our manager like, listen, man, saw the footprint. We didn't see anybody up there. He's like, you didn't see anybody. Like, we didn't see anybody. He's like, okay. So he walks us to the door, lets us out, and locks the door behind us. The restaurant is closed for the evening. Kid you not, he told us the next day, not five minutes later, a gunman drops through that same ceiling, puts everybody in the freezer, and robs the place, right? I got to tell you, the next day at work was awkward, right? Like, hey, I'm really sorry we didn't nab the gunman, right? Like, I'm not sure what the expected outcome was supposed to be. Everybody was fine. It wasn't, it was a huge deal, but then it wasn't. My point is, we were asked to do something. We learned a valuable lesson on how to take some things seriously. Well, on another level this morning, as we look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're challenged to take what the Lord tells us seriously about who we are and what we're supposed to do. So if you have your Bible, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 17. And we're going to work through. So we're going to look at a bunch of scriptures today, so just keep your Bible handy. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Everything, verse 18, is from God, who has reconciled us to himself. Circle that word, reconciled, underline, highlight, however you do it. We're going to spend some time talking about what that means today, but I, I don't want us to miss the importance of the definition of reconciled. Reconciled means this. It means to be made right or at peace with God. To be made right or at peace 
with God. Reconciled is not me believing that there's a God. Reconciled is not me okay with the idea of God or even me thinking, hey, God must be a pretty good guy. That, that is not what it means. It means that we have been made right, which means we have, put our, we have recognized that we're sinners, repented of our sin, and put our faith and trust in Jesus, who is the only one who can make us right with God. The old is gone, the new has come. We continue reading in verse 19. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Underline those words, message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors. Another key word. What's an ambassador? Uh, I mean, we get it, right? Ambassadors between the countries. It's an authorized representative. It's someone who can speak for someone else. Here's the idea that we are messengers, that we are ambassadors for God and for reconciliation. Verse 20, therefore we're ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. If we had to summarize these verses, we could kind of do it in two words. And our, our whole time today kind of hangs on this one verse. We'll look at a bunch of verses, but it kind of hangs on this whole idea that we have been reconciled to God and we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. So here's the two words. If you love alliteration and think every sermon has to have it, here's your alliteration, all right? The first word is message. We, as Christ followers, have been giving a message, been given a message, and that message is the message of reconciliation, that we are to be made right or at peace with God. One theologian put it like this. He said, this is the great exchange. This is where Jesus took upon himself our sin, our shame, our guilt, and he gives us his righteousness so that positionally we are in Christ. We belong to God. We have been made right with God. These verses we see, we've been given a message, but here's the second thing. We've been given a ministry, that we are an ambassador for God, that regardless of your age, your socioeconomic status, where you're from, what job you have, what school you go to, regardless of all those things, we are an ambassador and our message is be reconciled to God. In these verses, we see God is calling us to do what he's already been doing, right? But this isn't the first time we see that in scripture. In fact, little crowd participation here. I think there are times that we've understood this concept already when God says things like this, you be holy for I am you forgive because you have been forgiven. So there are times where God is calling his character and saying, listen, this is who I am and I'm inviting you, I'm asking you to be like me. Throughout the Old and New Testament, we see God showcase his character and his love for us. There's a thread throughout scripture that shows how God has been pursuing us since the very beginning. I think mistakenly, sometimes we think the Old Testament is God's wrath and anger, but under Jesus, everything is great and there's grace and it's okay. And I want us to see in a few quick examples how God's pursuit of us, his ministry of reconciliation for us has been in place since the beginning of time. We're all going somewhere with this. Check it out. Here's the first example I want you to see of God's ministry of reconciliation. The first time was this. With Adam and Eve, God pursued Adam and Eve in the garden. God pursued Adam and Eve in the garden. Where we pick this up in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, as you probably know, were given one command, don't eat from the tree. They disobeyed. They ate from the tree. By the way, if we were there, we would have probably done the same thing. But they ate from the tree. As a result, they felt sin and shame and were hiding. We pick up in Genesis 3, verse 8. It looks like this. The man and his wife, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Scripture doesn't tell us a lot, but we get the full-on impression that God would come and walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, that he was already relational. He had spent time with them. He was not a distant God. And so when they disobeyed and God comes to look, 
what do we see? He says, the scripture says, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? And Adam answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Here's part of that redemption story, that reconciliation I'm talking about, is that God did not walk into the garden that day and then find out in those moments that Adam and Eve had already disobeyed. He already knew when he made his way to the garden that day. Get this. In spite of their disobedience, God met in the garden that day. What a beautiful picture of the gospel for us. Listen, it goes on to say that the first sacrifice had to be made for sin. And here's how we see God respond to that. It says this in Genesis 3, that the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. That was the first time a sacrifice was made for sin. So God's question wasn't, what did you do? What's wrong with you, Adam? His first question was, where are you? I I can't imagine and I try, that, 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 that verse is so humbling to consider that they walked with God every day and all of a sudden there's a separation. Not because God wanted it, but because they chose it. But God steps into that. He's pursued us since the beginning. Here's another example. God pursues Israel. If you've been in church very long, you know Israel, and there were times they were rebellious and they didn't listen to God and they sinned. Well, where we pick up this particular passage They've just been released from Egypt. They'd been in bondage there. And God calls Moses and he says, Moses, listen, I'm pursuing Israel. And I want you to hear what God says to Moses as we talk about this idea of reconciliation, of being made right or at peace with God. Here's what he says. Moses went up to God and the Lord called him from the mountain and said, this is what you say to the descendants of Jacob and what you're to tell the people of Israel. You have seen what I did for you in Egypt how I carried you on eagle's wings and I brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you'll be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. God had led them out of bondage and was consecrating them for himself. In spite of their disbelief, In spite of their rebellion, God reached out to them and is making them his own. That's a couple examples from the Old Testament. That's not exhaustive. That's a couple. But here's one from the New Testament that God pursues us. We see that God pursued Adam. God has pursued Israel. And God pursues us in John 3.16, probably a familiar verse. Here's what it says, John 3.16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but get it, to save the world through him. The backbone, the thread throughout all of scripture is mankind being redeemed or being reconciled to God. The very heart of God is to redeem mankind back to himself. And listen, it's what we read in 2 Corinthians 5, we've been given that ministry. God has set the example. God has reached out to us first, so now we can reach out to others. We see God's heart for reconciliation, and he calls us to do the same. So how do we live this out practically? We understand the theology, right? We understand that that God, this is who he is, this is the character of God, this is the nature of God, and yet he's calling us to do this. How do we live this out practically? I know for some this may seem overwhelming or kind of new, but we're gonna break it down and walk through this together. We're gonna talk about two points. I wanna make sure you get these. We're gonna talk about two practical ways that you can be an ambassador today. Here's the first one. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. My guess is, if you've been in church very long, this probably isn't new for you. In fact, you may say, Jeff, did you have another one? Because I'm kind of familiar with this. I think sometimes, at least for me, that, that's our problem, right? Sometimes the, thing, the Lord tells us things and it becomes so familiar that it becomes routine. 
It becomes so routine, it loses its importance to us. Yeah, 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 I, I get it. Love your neighbor, right? And yet, here's what God is calling us to do. Let's, let's look at some scripture. Jesus says to love our neighbor himself. So a good question might be, okay, then who's my neighbor? If I'm supposed to love my neighbor, who is my neighbor? This isn't the first time this question has been asked. In fact, in Luke chapter 10, we'll see a religious leader stands up while Jesus is teaching. It wasn't uncommon for people to stand up and ask a question, but a religious leader stands up and asks Jesus a question while he's teaching. We'll pick that up. We're in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 29. Here's what it says. Jesus is teaching, and an expert in the law stood up to test him. So let's just clarify real quick. This particular guy is not really looking for clarification. He's trying to catch Jesus. He's, he's trying to see if Jesus will trip up or change his answer. His motive is not right. But he stood up and he said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus asked him. So Jesus knows he's a religious leader. He's like, well, what, what's written in the law? Clearly you know the law. How do you read this? The man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Two commands, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus responded, you answered correctly, he told him. Do this and you'll live. But wanting to justify himself, some key phrases there. Wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who's my neighbor? What scripture is clarifying for us is the intent of the question. See, we talked a minute ago about how sometimes things become routine and callous to us. This, this guy knew, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. He knew that. He knew love your name. This wasn't an actual question for him. What he's trying to do is justify by saying, who's my neighbor? He's trying to say, does this really apply to me? Because he has not been loving God. He has not been loving his neighbor. And he's hoping Jesus will give an answer that makes him feel better about his lack of obedience. Some of the religious leaders during the day, not all, but some were notorious for looking for loopholes or excuses or reasons why they shouldn't follow the laws. Now, in all fairness, there were 613 laws. Be a bit overwhelming, right? So sometimes they would look and say, okay, are there laws that don't apply to me? Because it would sure may make my life easier. In this particular case, that's what he seems to be doing. The question was good. The motive was bad. How does this not apply to me? I gotta be honest, I've, I've asked questions like that too. You ever done that? Where you're like, okay, I hear what's happening, but certainly there's, I, that doesn't apply to me, right? I can think of some years ago, and listen, I could go on all day with these examples. This one's just a lot more entertaining. But I, um, I was driving home late from work. We got out of work late one night, and it was, I, honestly, I think it was like 2.30, and I come up on this like four-way stop thing. Um, it was like this weird circle, and so, I slow down, but it's 2.30. I'm exhausted. It's been a great day. And I'm like, there's nobody here. I know you've never been in this situation, especially if you live like out in Bethpage or somewhere. This never happens, right? But I just, I just roll through. Because, you know, that 18 seconds to stop, that's, that's time. So I look around. There's nobody. So I just roll through. And I get, just get past the stop sign, and I realize that my original estimate that nobody else was around was wildly inaccurate, right? There was, in fact, someone around, and he's paid to keep people from doing that. So he pulls me over, and I'm like, I, I got to be honest. I'm not trying to lie. I'm not making up stuff. I'm just like, bro, I'm straight busted. I'm just like, bro, it has been a long day, and I just, I didn't see anybody, and there was nobody around, and I just went through. And um, he lovingly reminded me, Stop signs are stop signs, whether I think they, I need to stop or not, right? Whether it's two in the morning or two in the afternoon or there's crowds or not crowds, the stop sign's a stop sign. Now, I checked with Brandon Clark, one of our police officers this week, as I was preparing, and I said, like, hey, man, are those stop signs? Are those still a thing? And he's like, stop signs are totally still a thing. So just so you know, they're still a thing. He was very kind. He didn't write me a ticket, but here's the deal. 
as badly as I wanted my excuse, my reasons to be valid of why I didn't have to obey the law, they came up very, very short. What seemed like complete logic in my head meant nothing. Here's, here's why I share that. I think sometimes it's easy for us to ask, when doesn't this commandment apply to me? When is it okay for me not to love my neighbor, right? What, does this really matter? I want to make sure we don't confuse something, loving our neighbor with condoning everything they do. So we're going to talk about loving your neighbor, but we're not saying you have to approve of everything they do. I don't want us to confuse that. And here's how I know that we know the difference. Here's how I know that we don't have to really flesh that out. If you're a parent, you already know this is true, right? Because if you're a parent, unless your kids are absolute angels, which is totally possible, there's probably a time, maybe it's only 2%, but that 2% time where you're like, I don't even know if these are my kids. They're crazy, <laughs> right? Like they, there are times when we're like, wow, I love these kids, but I cannot approve of this behavior. We understand how to separate that. And by the way, if you're not a parent yet, you were a kid at one time, and you've been the recipient of love in spite of your craziness, all right? So we all understand this concept that loving someone doesn't mean we say, oh, everything you do is great. No, I love you. I love my kids in spite of the nonsense sometimes. We are called to love our neighbor in spite of what we think about them. Jesus was often scorned and ridiculed by the religious people for hanging out with people that were in the margins, by hanging out with people that were not socially acceptable, that nobody else would hang out with, the people that were sinners. And yet you could find Jesus there. He didn't have any loopholes. He didn't have any excuses. Here's some excuses that I've heard or maybe that I've made over the years of why I don't have to love my neighbor. I mean, some are, probably most aren't you, but maybe there is one. One is, man, my excuses, they don't really look like me. I don't think we'd have anything in common, right? They vote different from me. They're conservatives, whatever, right? They vote different than me. I can't love them. They're from somewhere else. They're oriented different than I am. They don't, they don't speak my language. Hey, doesn't the church do that? Isn't that what the church does? I'm afraid. I'm really busy. Certainly not an exhaustive list, but one of the things we have to ask is, do we have a loophole? So Jesus responded to the scribe by sharing the story of the Good Samaritan. Brief recap of the Good Samaritan. A man is dying on the side of the road. He's been mugged and he's dying. And two religious leaders walk by, a priest and a Levite. Both of those religious leaders don't even cross the road. They see the man in suffering and pain and they keep going on their way. Meanwhile, a third man comes, a Samaritan, an unlikely helper, comes helps the man, gets him to help, and actually pays for him to be taken care of. Something I think we've got to notice is that somewhere in the theology, somewhere in the excuse, in the loophole of the priest and the Levite, it would have been okay for that man to die. Their excuses were so strong that it was okay for a man to die on the side of the road. I don't think we want to think like that, but let's consider it for a minute. How far do our excuses, do our loopholes take us? Listen, Jesus never says it's okay not to love those type of people. He just tells us to do it. And if we can be really real, praise God he didn't take that approach with us. Because where would the line be? You know what she did? You know what he does? Man, if you heard about him, praise God he has not taken that approach with us. Throughout Scripture, 
we see an intentionality to redeem, to restore, to bring us to peace with God. Here's what Jesus taught in the Good Samaritan. That our neighbor is anyone who is in our path, who is in our reach, anyone who is in our life, regardless of where you are. Let me summarize what loving your neighbor means. We'll get to point number two. Loving your neighbor means this, is that we share Jesus with our words and actions. Absolutely love them, absolutely serve them, but give them the hope of reconciliation. Give them the hope of Jesus. Number two, we said number one was love your neighbor. Number two is go wherever God leads you. Go wherever God leads you. You know, sometimes I think we get hung up on the word go, which means passport, right? Like if I'm gonna go, I gotta gotta get a passport. Absolutely not. In Matthew 28, Jesus says these words that go and make disciples. The word go literally translate to as you are going, which means wherever you are. So if you're in Hendersonville at Publix, be there. If you are in Piggly Wiggly and Cross Plains, still exist, then be there, right? Like wherever it is, God has you. That's where you are going. That's what you're called to do. You don't need an event on the church calendar to go and be an ambassador and to be surrendered what God has for you to do. Although we'll keep having them and they're awesome, but you don't need it. You aren't anywhere on accident. Let me lovingly just encourage you with this. Don't wait until you think life is gonna be easier to invest in the life of someone else. Some of you are thinking, man, when I retire, that's gonna be awesome. Don't wait. Some of you are thinking, when it gets a little easier, don't wait. Start with your circle of impact and start to love your neighbor. I'm often inspired by people in our church. Sometimes I feel like, Right now, I'm teaching to the choir. So many of you love so well. And I'm inspired by stories that I hear. And I hear stories all the time. I hear stories of of business owners and people who are having Bible studies and finding ways to love people that come in, right? I'm hearing stories of families who love and serve other families and babysit and do whatever they need to do to love their neighbors well with cookouts and whatever. I think of some specific examples like Miss Shirley. Miss Shirley lives in White House, Her husband passed a couple years ago and she intentionally loves her neighbors well. And one thing she does on Halloween is make a bunch of treats, incredible, incredible cook, makes treats, sets them out and puts a movie up on her garage door for neighbors to come as an opportunity for her to love on them. It's awesome. Another one of the families in our church, they own a, a transportation company. And every time you get on one of their buses and try to sign into the Wi-Fi, it brings you to the long, hollow sermon page, directly pointed, yeah, directly pointed to this series called That's a Great Question. So if you're trying to figure things out, there are answers there. Like, that's incredible. They estimate over 150,000 people a year sign in. I'm not telling you you have to do what those people do. I'm saying whatever resources God has given you, whatever opportunities are in front of you, use those to be a messenger, an ambassador of reconciliation to those that are around you. Let me me encourage you with this thought. If the Holy Spirit has been stirring in you, if the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you and you know, you know when God is trying to make you unsettled, listen, listen, Do not let the Holy Spirit fall on deaf ears. Do not be so busy that you are not dialed in to what God is trying to do to you. Here's a promise I can make because I've experienced this for myself. And thousands of you at Long Hollow would say the exact same thing, but don't miss this. Your life will never be as fulfilling, never be as fulfilling, exciting, or full of faith than when you submit to what God has for you. The moment you smit and lay it all down. Will it be easy? Nobody said that. Will you have difficulty? Absolutely. But you will never have more fulfillment, excitement, or faith is when you are fully trusting God and how he's leading you. We have to use the gifts given to us and the opportunities we have to speak the message of reconciliation to the people around us. Uh, This is Kevin Carter. He's a photographer, popular in the 80s and the 90s, was part of a team that would travel to different places, lived a very difficult life, um, had seen more things by 
the age of 25 than all of us will combine. Uh, but he was a photographer and he was assigned to Sudan. Sudan was experiencing a famine in 1993-94. So he went, and he went to take pictures, and you may not know who Kevin is, but you probably know his photography work. This picture is called The Vulture and the Little Girl. This is a difficult picture to look at, so if you don't want to look, don't look. But here's what I'm telling you. Kevin was on assignment, and this little girl was struggling trying to get to some food and a vulture came and you, you know what he's thinking. So Kevin sat and he waited for the, the wings of the vulture to, to flare up so he could get an even better picture and it didn't happen so he took this picture. But different stories say after this, he may have shooed the bird away, we don't know. But he took this picture and eventually it got into the hands of the New York Times. The New York Times printed it, and he became a Pulitzer winner and began to travel and speak based on his photography. One of the questions that he was asked often while he was speaking was, what happened to the little girl? You were there, she was in front of you. What happened, did she live? Did she make it? Like we, we see the struggle, we understand the impact of the photo, but what about the well-being of the little girl? His answer? I was not there to get involved. I was not there to get involved. Kevin had seen a lot in his life. He'd endured many things. The guilt of many different things led him to take his own life. Let me turn a corner here in the church. Make no mistake, church. We are here to get involved. We are here, our neighbors, our friends, the people that are around us that we're close to and our circle of influence, many are close to eternity without knowing Christ. We are not sideline Christians. We are not here to watch the world go by and enjoy the, the benefits that Christ has given to us. We are ambassadors for Christ. I wanna challenge you to consider, how have you surrendered so that God can use you in the days to come. There are many times I think about times that I should have gotten involved and I didn't. And I have some serious regret. I can't change those, but I can change what happens from this day forward. I can choose to be submitted to God and I can choose to love my neighbor and to be obedient and to see our friends help step from death to life. Full transparency, it, it's not normal to be a Christian for five, 10, two, three, five, 10, 20, 25 years and never share your faith with somebody. To never decide about that. We don't see it in scripture. We don't see that in this book. Every time someone meets Jesus in this book, the old is gone, the new has come, they're a new creation, lives are transformed. So today I'm not asking you to start a new habit. We're not asking you to turn over a new leaf. We're saying this, let's fall in love with the God who has loved us from the beginning. Let's fall in love with the God who throughout the thread of scripture has pursued us. And as a result of that love, that response to who he is, we can love our neighbors well and be surrendered to him. Our prayer is that you'll fall in love with Jesus and be passionate for him. Would you close your eyes with me? As we wrap up today, listen, the, the need, the spiritual need is great. It's everywhere. It's, it's where you live. It may be in this room. The spiritual need is great. And the need for people to say yes for the mission of God is great. Say yes to the mission of God. We're here to get involved. You may be sitting here and going, Jeff, I'm with you. Let's go. I'm in. Then your prayer would be, Lord, I'm surrendered. You show me what I'm supposed to do and I'm going to do it. 
You may be sitting here and thinking, I'm, I've got to process this. I'm, I'm not sure how to. That's okay too. I would say to you, if you're in that boat, I would say that you should consider praying something like this. Lord, would you reveal yourself to me? Lord, remind me of my first love. Remind me of my passion for you. Remind me of what you have done in my life. You see, in the same way we get comfortable with the idea of loving our neighbor, that the very name of Jesus can become routine so that it doesn't even move us anymore. That our story of redemption has become so blasé and so routine that it doesn't move us to even worship the same way that we did when we first gave our lives to Christ. So maybe your prayer is, God, restore this passion for you. Restore this fire for you. God, would you give me a hunger for you above everything else in this world? And as you fall in love with Jesus, you're gonna care what he cares about. And he loves people that are far from him. Church, is time. There's never been a better day for the church to say yes to the mission of God. Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord, we take seriously what you've written and we believe it. We want to be people who are ministers of reconciliation, who love you, who desire you more than anything else in this world, Lord. I pray that we step out of this place and we love well the people that are around us. In the name of Jesus, we pray.